irrespective of your color, race, location, or church denomination. Since we have one Father and one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are considered one family even if we come from different churches and denominations. For this reason, we must unite even we have different language, color, and region, we must unite for the purpose of growing together in faith. We must unite for the purpose of protecting the faith from the attack of the evil one. But most of all, the purpose of church unity is to display God's glory. In the beginning of Christianity at the time of Acts period, church unity is one of the major issues. A story is written, recorded by Luke in Acts 15, that the issue is whether Gentile believers need to follow the rules of Jewish law. And so the council was called, called the Jerusalem Council, the debate is between the Gentile groups led by Paul and Barnabas, and the other group is the Jewish Christians. <coughs> and so both presented their view. Then finally, Apostle Paul stood and clarified that God gave him vision that there is no more unclean animal. It signifies that even the unclean Gentiles, according to uh, Israel understanding can now hear the gospel. So the Jerusalem Council, which headed by James, concluded that and issued a guideline of how the Gentiles should act as Christians. The Jewish Christian agreed, and the Gentiles group also agreed on this new ruling. They were united even they have differences in the past. This is one of an example of a unity among churches. When you love, well, when love prevails among believers, especially in the time of strong disagreement, it presents to the watching world the mark of a true follower of Jesus Christ. Unity among churches is crucial in our Christian life. Why? Because other churches can monitor whether this particular church is still in the right teaching. It's, it functions like a check and balance to what the churches believe. Because we human, due to our fallen condition or to our inherent sin, sometimes we are still driven by our worldly knowledge in interpreting the scriptures. And if we are not careful to our theological understanding or our Christian practices, we might fall to earth in our biblical understanding. In church history, many churches fell to destruct. If churches do not check their belief and their practices, even us here, we might fall to disrupt. Remember that the Bible is the ultimate standard of moral truth. We must be warned that the Bible is being constantly attacked by the enemy. And if we don't guard the word of God, we will become victim of the fairy darts of the evil one. One way to protect us from these false doctrines is unity among churches. During the early times of Christianity, the Christian belief had already been attacked. But thank God that He did not allow this evil one to win, for the Lord stilled the hearts of our church father to protect the gospel. And so the churches from different places gathered together and formed a council. They discussed 
questionable belief and decided which one is biblical correct and which one is false doctrine. Then the council of churches issued their confession of faith. One of the known, uh, known confession of faith are the Apostles' Creed in the 12th century, then the Nicene Creed in 325 AD, then was revised after 50 years in 381 AD, the Constantinople Creed, and then after again almost 100 years, the Chalcedonian Creed in 331 AD. After the Dark Ages, the time of Reformation came in the 1500s, Protestant churches issued again a confession of faith to protect themselves from false teaching. Like the 39 Articles of Church of England in 1571, then Reformed and the Presbyterian issued the Westminster Confession of Faith in the mid 1640s. Then the New Hampshire Baptist Confession of Faith in 1833. And even recently, in 1978, Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. And even us here, we are united. Even we are from different churches. We have unity that we, because we have the same confession of faith. Our unity is based on our theological view. Church unity is dependent upon common sense of belief, of doctrinal belief. We believe that there is one God. We have the share same understanding, we share the same understanding that three person in one Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus Christ is 100% man and 100% God. Jesus was born of a virgin birth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, resurrected after three days, and now at the right hand of God. We believe in the Bible alone is the highest authority with its 66 books. We believe that salvation is by God's grace alone. We are saved through faith alone, through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone is the way to salvation. And we live for the glory of God alone. Our churches are united based on these truths, and it's not negotiable. Each one of these truths are revered in our in Christian faith. Why? Because for many centuries our church fathers sacrificed their life to preserve this truth. Many faithful Christians who defended this truth were excommunicated, arrested, jailed, thrown into dungeons, feed into lions, burned in the stake, beheaded, and martyred for the sake of preserving the truth which we enjoy now. If other so-called Christian churches don't stand on this truth, then we don't have fellowship with them. We don't have one faith with the English and the Christian in the Philippines because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is truly God. We don't share a common faith with the Mormons for we believe that the Bible is complete with its 66 books. We don't have common belief with the Catholics for we believe that salvation is by grace alone and not from anybody else, nor even from our good works. We disagree with the oneness church because we believe that there are three persons in one Godhead. Each person is fully God, but there is one God. 
We don't have one faith with the liberal theologians of our time saying that the Bible has errancy, has mistakes, and not accurate. We don't share the same understanding in moralistic principles that there are different ways to go to heaven because we believe that Jesus is the only way. We disagree with the modern science understanding of Darwin's theory of evolution because we believe that God created everything in its own kind. We are united with the churches that believe that God only created man and woman and no in between. Having said that, we don't have unity with these churches having different doctrine on us. On the other hand, we can have unity with churches with respect to the secondary level of Christian belief. Secondary in a sense that the Bible did not give specific instruction on how to practice those principles. We have the we, we can still have fellowship with them, even on these different practices. For example, Presbyterian Church practice infant baptism, pedo baptism. One majority of us here believe that in adult baptism, called infant baptism. They believe that babies of the Christian parents should be baptized because they are part of the church. But finally, the circumcision analogy of the nation Israel. While Creed Baptists believe that the only people who consciously understand the gospel, repent from their sins, and believe in Jesus Christ for salvation should be baptized. Despite of our theological difference in practices, we can still have unity with them. In the practice of church ordinance in the Lord's Supper, some practices that sharing of the body and blood of Christ is exclusive to local church, means those only members of the local church. Other churches allow members uh, non-members to have communion provided they state that they are believers or part of the universal church. While other churches practice open communion, it, it means that anyone can partake the Lord's Supper. But despite of the dip, uh, differences in practices, <coughs> we can be united with them because the Bible did not give specific guidelines on how to practice these principles. But still we consider them brothers and sisters since they agree on the previously mentioned non-negotiables, the, the primary beliefs. Another secondary level of theological differences is the form of government. Some are reformed, some are Baptists, some are Presbyterians, some are confessional reform, some are free churches. They have different way on how to run the government, the, their government churches. Example, the congregational form, uh, the church members are the one making decision on how the, the church go. They're the one voting. While in Presbyterians, only the elders and the synods decided the direction of the church. But as long as we agree with the previously mentioned non-negotiable primary beliefs, we can still have unity with them. But there is also so-called third level of theological belief, where churches can have unity even they disagree, even we agree to disagree on these theological principles. One is the understanding of spiritual giftings. Secessionists believe that spiritual gifts, such as speaking of tongues, miraculous healing, prophecy, 
are no longer valid because the Bible is complete and no more such revelation is needed because everything now is revealed in Christ while continually is believed that spiritual gifts is a sign of gifting of the Holy Spirit and since the Lord did not yet return this will remain according to their understanding another issue is the hermeneutical principles of understanding the Bible there are two main groups the dispensationalists and the covenantalists both have different understanding but they get along with each other but now we have this progressive that dispensationalists and we have the covenantalists progressing the commonality of these two principles are getting closer with these already and not yet principles. Another theological difference that we agree to disagree is the understanding about what to happen in the future, which is Catholicity. Why there are different views? Because nobody knows exactly what will happen in the future. Millennials believe in literal 1,000 years of reign of Christ on earth. But even within the millennialist camp, there are different, there are diversity of understanding the second coming of Christ. Some believe that it will happen before, in the middle, or in the end of tribulation or, or the beginning of a millennium. Why a millennialist believe that there is no literal by thousand years of reign of Christ since Jesus already reigning in our heart in the end of what happening on earth? Whether you are continuous, cessationalist, dispensationalist, covenantalist, a millennialist, millennialist, if we believe that salvation is by grace alone, through Christ alone, by faith alone, for the glory of God alone, then we can have unity. After explaining the history of unity among churches and the doctrinal disagreement and agreements from the other churches, now let us picture how this unity among churches look like in our setting. Here are some pictures among unity among churches. One is sharing of preacher. For example, uh, Pastor Aaron, we invited to preach in our church in Crossroad. For me, being invited to preach in Pastor Jacques' church in Abu Dhabi, this endeavor bring great joy in the heart of the preacher. Not only it increased the knowledge of the hearer about Jesus Christ, but it also bring unity among churches. Church unity brings joy to the Lord because it displays His character of unity. There is unity among the three persons in Trinity. Jesus gives honor to the Father. The Father is delighted to his son Jesus and the Holy Spirit steered the hearts of men to give glory to God the Father and to Jesus Christ. A good example of unity is among the siblings of the family. For example, if my son is driving my uh, kids, my, my, my daughter to train station, it gives me joy in my heart since he is obeying my instruction to love one another, following the biblical principles. And if one of my kids is bullying his or her siblings, it grows my heart because it creates this unity and the joy in the house is done. If I see my children washing the dishes or 
washing the clothes, I rejoice. Not only because they are obeying me as parents, but they are carrying each other burden in the family. Another form of display of church unity is when other churches, like Redeemer Church of Dubai, train other church leaders to become effective in their ministry. One of which is the Golf Training Center, where me, Pastor Aaron, and formerly Pastor Rafi and Pastor Joseph belongs. It's a seminary, a Bible school, and the Redeemer Church. They established this school to equip potential church leaders from different churches, to become future leaders in their respective churches, to become good teachers or, or ministry of the world, ministers of the world, to become future deacons, pastors, elders, and to become future missionaries. This endeavor is a good example of unity among churches. This conference is an excellent picture of unity among churches. As you can see, we have speakers from different churches, different like-minded churches. We have import from Abu Dhabi, from ECC, Pastor Christopher Longport, and the imported foreigner, Brother Shannon Phillips from Covenant Road Church, and Meron Ding Paningit, students <laughs> There are other ways to display churches among churches, youth among churches, like partnering with other missionaries church missionaries by providing financial support, logistics, training, and most of all, prayers. Now, maybe you're asking, how can I be part of the unity among churches when I'm not even sure I'm part of the body of Christ? Maaaring nagtatanong kayo sa inyong sarili, paano naman ako? makakashare ng, ng unity if I'm not even sure kung hindi ko sigurado na kasama ba ako kay Christo Jesus. The truth is, you cannot. You cannot be part of the unity of the church unless you are a born and believer of Jesus Christ. But there is a good news. You can be part of the unity of the church if you believe in the gospel message. In the beginning, man is united with God in the Garden of Eden. But when Adam and Eve fell into the temptation of the evil one, that unity is broken. And since God is holy and righteous, he detested evil, and so men were thrown up on his presence. And on that sad day, the unity of man and God was broken. But God is gracious and merciful. Because of his love, God found a way to reconnect us to himself by sending his own son to become man in the person of Jesus Christ. He became man to fulfill the righteous requirement which humanity cannot accomplish because of our sin. Jesus lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and became, and because of his righteous work, God raised him on the third day to become righteousness to men, to those who will believe. Friends, if you believe that Jesus Christ as sure as the only way to righteousness and repented from your sin, God will unite you to himself. And on that day, you will be part of the body of Christ and you can have fellowship with other believers from other churches. 
But finally, the common factor in unity among churches is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the ultimate purpose of this unity among churches is to display God's glory to the world so that God will get all the glory. But there will come a time that there will be an ultimate unity among the believers. When from all tribes and people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and crying out with a loud voice, Glory to our God who sits on the throne and on the Lamb. That day is the ultimate day of church unity. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and we give you glory that even <coughs> we are sinners, you save us to unite again with yourself. Lord, let your people have love just like the way you gave it to us, that we may love other churches also, so that we might just display to the world the love that you have and we can hide this shoulder to go. This we ask to our Son, to your Son, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.